Pentecost and Tabernacles all center around a certain feature of harvest. For example, Passover is centered around the barley harvest, Pentecost is centered around the wheat harvest, Tabernacles is centered around the grape harvest. The grapes, we happen to be taping this uh, in the month of November. You may be watching this in uh, March, April, June, or September. We don't, we don't ever know when we're going to air the program. But so you'll know the time I'm here is toward the end of November. Now, the grape harvest has already taken place from the month of September and October, but there are still some places in Hebron in the first of November where the grape harvest is taking place. So tabernacles really can be an allusion to the grape harvest, but it also is a time of celebrating the seven different types of food that God gave you in the land of Israel. Now, please, please follow me here because this is where it gets very, very important. If there's going to be something called a rapture, then the imagery has to be somewhere in some of the feast. If there's coming a tribulation, the imagery has to be somewhere in some of the feast, one or two or three of the feast or whatever. If there's coming a rule of Christ on the earth for a thousand years, these are great events. These events I have just named are earth-shaking, world-shaking events. And if they are earth-shaking, world-shaking events, what, are, what does that mean? That means that they have to be somewhere revealed in the Feast of Israel. All right. Now think about this for just a moment because this is very important. I want you to, I want you to grasp this. Barley is a, is a grain that is harvested, wheat is harvested, and grapes are cut from the vine. But every one of those are different from the other. For example, how do you get, you know, barley has a chaff on it, wheat has a hard shell on it, and grapes have skin on it. How do you remove that to get what's on the inside? With barley, the old way was to lay the barley down and beat it with a stick. You beat it, and then you take what's called a winnowing fork and go under it. Uh, if you had a winnowing fork, I'd use you for the illustration. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you should have brought your winnowing fork. Good thing you didn't bring your fork on the bus, right? So you take that winnowing fork and you throw the grain up in the air and then the wind blows the chaff away and all you have is the barley. Now here's what's important about Passover that people have to understand. At Passover, there's no leaven allowed in the bread for seven days. Leaven in the Bible represents sin. Now to me, a barley harvest that has a soft grain that just has to be beaten and the wind can blow it away is a picture of the saints of God because we're not supposed to have leaven because leaven represents sin. Now watch what happens. If you go to the next feast all men were to celebrate, you have at that feast uh, a wheat harvest, and the wheat's very hard. Watch, you go, if you've never heard this, you're going to love this. In the Roman time, they took a board, and you, stand, you stood on the board, and you took an animal, and you went all around a flesh... A, a fle, a th a th a th Listen to this. You know what I almost said? I almost said a fleshing floor. <laughs> That's a new word. We need to remember that one, guys. That's a new word, a fleshing floor. You went over a threshing floor with this board, and what happened? It was, it was hard. It had um, stones embedded in it, and it would crush that, the, the outer part of that shell, separate it, but it wouldn't damage wheat because wheat's very hard. Right. Then you winter that, and the wind carries it away. But the board was called a tribulum in Latin. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, we use the word in the New Testament, or, or the, the scripture, I should say, uses the word tribulation, Matthew 24, right? Now, that gives you the imagery of how that connects to Pentecost, which connects to the wheat harvest, which connects with how the grain has to be separated. You see what I'm saying? Now, grapes are totally different because you, you, you have to be careful with grapes. But you take grapes, but you still have to get the skin off of that grape or separate what I call the, the blood of the grape from the outer skin. And they usually do that by stepping on it, right? Well, you know, in the book of Revelation, when you get to the latter part of the tribulation, do you know what it's called? The wine press of the wrath of God. And it even uses the term grapes of wrath. It doesn't even use the word wheat or barley, but it uses grapes. Now, as we start developing this and as we start sh sharing this with people, I want you to understand what I'm saying. So watch carefully. If the feast have to give us a picture of some kind of these three main events, rapture, tribulation, right, and kingdom, where he's going to rule, then you're going to find them in Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Now here we go. There is a remnant of people in the earth. In the book of Revelation, there are two chapters addressed to the overcomer, to the overcomer, to the seven times, right? Seven churches. Seven times he says, to him that overcometh. There is a group of people on earth that is an overcoming remnant who are looking for Jesus to return. They give to the poor and the needy. They pay their tithe. They give their offerings. They're faithful to church. Those are the people striving for perfection in Christ. Okay, when I say striving... A person that strives for perfection, 
understands they're not perfect. But they want to lay aside things to get to a, a place where God is pleased with them. Now, we know it's the blood of Jesus that redeems us. You know, I, I'm going to get all kinds of mail on your preaching works, not preaching works. I'm simply telling you, when you live right, your works will be good. Your men will know you by your what? Works of righteousness. They'll know you because your works will be good and they will glorify who? What does the Bible say? They'll say, he's a real Christian. She's a real Christian. You can, you can take him with that word. That's what we want to be. When we talk about striving for perfection, that's what we're talking about. Now, say that. Christ-like. Christ-like. He said it. That's exactly the word. Now, watch this. To me, the rapture is a picture of the barley harvest. No leaven, seven days of no leaven, representing the seven-year tribulation or the seven years that we would be in heaven while the seven-year tribulation is going on. No leaven, which represents sin, allowed during that seven-day period. Okay? Now, boy, look, this could go into hours and hours of teaching, honestly, if we had the time for it. It's so detailed. Now, after the church is caught up, there is still a remnant on earth of Jewish men, which are 144,000 mentioned in the book of Revelation. They are caught up to the Lord in heaven. They, to me, are a picture of the wheat harvest because they had to go through a part of the tribulum, a part of the tribulation, see, but after they've gone through part of it, then that grain is separated and taken to God. And again, I don't have time to develop this because they are called the first fruits unto God, just like the church is the first fruits unto Christ, the 144,000 are the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. Now, the thing about the tribulation is at that point you go into the latter part of the tribulation and you've got to have the imagery of what happens during the fall, which is the grape harvest and the crushing of the grapes. This is why in the book of Revelation, as you get into the tribulation, it mentions grapes of wrath and the winepress of the wrath of God. Why? Because God is crushing, and you have, you have uh, even in the, you know, you have the scriptures in Isaiah about he treads out the wine vat. Remember that? Isaiah talked about that. The Messiah would tread out the wine vat. So my point is this, that for people, and I get mail or we get emails of people, and it happens all the time, and they'll say, you're teaching people that Jesus is coming, and you're teaching about something called a rapture, and the word's not in the Bible. It's not in the English Bible, but the word, call it the catching up, the gathering together, the catching away, the episynagogue. I could give you five words you could call it. And they get upset. And I always tell people they haven't studied this from a pure feast Hebraic perspective because here's what God has done. See, God knew. Let me say this to you. When Jesus was on earth, the Bible said that if, he would have, if, if, if they would have recorded everything he did, think about this, all of the books in the world could not contain what he did. So we've got four Gospels. I'm just curious to know what else he did. I mean, I'm going to go to heaven and find out, okay, tell me the rest of the story. You know, you only gave me four books down there. Give me the rest of the story. Now, here's the thing. When I, re when I realized that, I also realized we only have 66 books in our Bible that give us what we need. If, if that's all we have, that's all we need. But the, what God did, which is so great, is he hid through types and shadows the entire future. And all we have to do is dig out the imagery of what he wrote, and it will tell us the future. Does that make sense to you? Now, see, that's not your Western theological way of thinking. That's not your systematic theology. And I'm not mocking or making fun because I have friends of mine that are PhDs who are professors of languages and religion in the community where I live have great admiration for these men. They are brilliant men. But I think they would agree with me when I say this in that there are times that when you look at the, the Word of God, you lay line on line, precept on precept, and if you're not careful, that's how you see. That's all you see. But then if you go into the type and shadow, you add with that and it broadens it out. Then you go into what we call the prophetic patterns of the Old Testament, how the Old Testament stories hide future prophecies, mm -hmm. that broadens it out. So pretty soon you, you have questions to all, uh, to all these prophetic things that you have, and you say to yourself, that's it. Oh, man, that's it. So when I begin to study the idea of the rapture, first from the Jewish wedding, and then later from the three main feasts, and begin to see these patterns, to me, it answered the question. I didn't have a doubt. I said, there it is. That represents this. This represents that. That represents that. And see, the neatest thing about the Lord is this, and this is what everybody needs to understand, because I had a great gentleman. He, was a, he happened to be at one time a great a general overseer of the Church of God denomination in Cleveland, Tennessee. And I won't name him because I don't like to just drop names like that. But we were having lunch one day, and I was asking him, I said, Brother so-and-so, I said, 
why, and this was a few years ago, I said, why is it that even in my own denomination, I'm so misunderstood 